In this short video, we're going to look at a couple of applications which can be modeled using nonlinear differential equations. Nonlinear differential equations are actually very common for modeling, but even the simplest uh, models may require a numerical solution. Uh, and that's not what this class is about. So we're going to limit ourselves to uh, applications where we actually have tools to solve the differential equation analytically. So our first example is where you have variable mass. Newton's second law can be interpreted as saying that, well, uh, the uh, time rate of change of the momentum, momentum is mass times velocity, is the net force acting on the system. Um, now, uh, if you have an object and you're just lifting it with a constant force, say of five pounds, opposing that, of course, is the force due to gravity. But this object is going, we're going to assume, is going to have a constant mass. And if the mass is constant, then the derivative of the momentum is just that constant m times v prime. And we get to our usual mass times acceleration is the sum of the forces, or it's the net force. But what if your mass is changing with time? Well, let's take a look at an example. We've got a 10-foot long chain. It's coiled on the ground. Uh, and it's being lifted upward by a constant force of 5 pounds. The chain, I should say weighs, one pound per foot. We're going to use x of t to represent the height of the top of the chain, and we'd like to find an equation for x of t. So let's look at this in a little diagram. We have a force of five pounds going up, and the weight of the chain that has been lifted so far, or the weight of the chain at time t, is going to be uh, pulling down, so opposing each other. And then the net of those two forces is going to be the uh, time rate of change of the momentum. So since the chain weighs one pound per foot, that means our variable x is actually the same as the weight of the chain that has been lifted at time t. So our net force then would be 5 minus the weight, which would be 5 minus x. Now our mass, remember, uh, to go from a weight to mass, you have to divide by the acceleration due to gravity. And so now this is our differential equation. Let's go ahead and use the product rule on the left-hand side. And so now I have uh, two derivatives, dx dt and dv dt. Now I can replace dv dt with the second derivative with respect to x, and I can replace v with the first derivative with respect to x. So we're going to have to do some work in order to solve this as a second order nonlinear differential equation. Why is it a nonlinear differential equation? Because it involves the square of the first derivative here. Uh, so we're going to go back and rewrite it in terms of two variables, x and v. And then we're going to take advantage of the chain rule. I'd like to, to actually uh, rewrite this in terms of the derivative of v with respect to x rather than the derivative of v with respect to t. Now, why would I want to do that? Well, if I write it then in differential form, it would be nice if this were an exact equation. Uh, but 
if I take my partial derivatives, uh, I can see that they're not equal to each other. So the, this, remember that the function times dx is going to be our m function. And we don't have a dy here. We have d, v is our other variable. So the function times dv is the n function. So I take the partial derivative of m with respect to v. That gives me 2v, but the partial derivative with respect to of n with respect to x gives me v. But maybe we can find an integrating factor which makes this an exact equation. So if I subtract those two, of course, I only get v. If I divide that by my n function, which is xv, I get a function of x only. So I should be able to use that to find an integrating factor. It would be e raised to the power of the integral of 1 over x dx. Of course, that's the natural log of x, or the absolute value of x. So if I assume x is positive, I don't have to worry about the x. I'm sorry, I don't have to worry about the absolute value signs. So my integrating factor is just going to be x. So let's go ahead and multiply both sides by x. Now we have an exact equation. And so we'll go ahead and I'm going to look at the second term. It really doesn't matter in this problem. Uh, I'm going to say that I know that the second term must be the partial derivative of f with respect to v. So I'll anti-differentiate with respect to v. And instead of getting a constant, I get this constant function of integration, which depends on x only. So then I take that expression, calculate the partial derivative with respect to x. And so then I'll set that equal to the m function here, which leads to h prime equaling the 32x squared minus 160x. And I can anti differentiate to find h of x. So now I know that the equation or the solution to this uh, modified differential equation where we're looking at v as a function of x uh, would have this form. Normally write it equal to zero because we were just looking for some uh, particular solution. But in this case we have a uh, boundary condition, uh, which says that x of 0 equals 0. Uh, I, and so c1 is going to be 0 in this case. Uh, yes, it's true that we made the assumption that x is positive, but we can still calculate this using the limit uh, as uh, x approaches 0. All right, so we now have the equation to the solution to the differential e equation when we considered v as a function of x. So let's go ahead and solve for v here. So our v, which is now dx dt, is going to have this expression, this radical expression or square root expression. And so we can use separation of variables and integrate both sides and then solve that uh, equation for x. We want to get x as a function of t. So we'll do some uh, multiplication by negative 32 over 3. So that's why we have a new constant c sub 3. We'll square both sides and solve for x. And uh, we get this expression here. How do we determine this constant C3? Well, we go ahead back to our, our boundary condition. And uh, so then that gives us C3 is 4 radical 10. And now we have the uh, solution. Now, we have to be careful here. If we go ahead and plot this solution, uh, that solution is valid for all values of t as a function, but as a solution to the differential equation, it's not. Because 
Let's go back and look at the situation. Our upward force is five. So when we have pulled up five pounds, which would be five feet of chain, it's not going to go up anymore. Now it's, it's in equilibrium, it's balanced. The upward force is going to equal the downward force. So really, as soon as we reach five feet, and of course that's going to be after half a second, this equation is no longer valid. So really our interval of convergence should be from zero to 0 0.5. Another example or application which uh, yields a nonlinear differential equation that we can solve uh, is rocket motion. So here what we're assuming is that we have a big mass, a planet, the moon, something uh, with a relatively large mass, and we're going to assume that it's a spherical, essentially spherical in shape. And so far from that mass, meaning uh, much larger than just the radius of that mass, uh, we have our rocket, which has a smaller mass. And um, the distance from the center of mass of the planet or moon to the uh, center of mass of the rocket is going to be y. And so the attraction due to gravity of two masses uh, is measured by this formula. It's a constant times the product of the two masses divided by the distance between their centers of mass squared. Now, if we're talking about the, the Earth, well, it doesn't really matter. If we're talking about any celestial body, when you're on the surface, so when Y equals capital R, capital R is the radius, means you're on the surface, then that force is just going to simplify to the force due to the acceleration acceleration of gravity. And if I set those equal to each other, I can get an expression for this constant k. It'd be the acceleration due to gravity times the uh, square of the radius divided by the mass of the large object. So if I put that into uh, Newton's second law and write that in uh, standard form, you can see that this is a nonlinear differential equation because I have a rational function here, one uh, g r squared over y squared. So to come up with a solution or at least get some information about this differential equation, I am going to now think of v as a function of y as opposed to a function of t, which means I'm going to have to use my chain rule again. And now I have a differential equation where I can use separation of variables. If I integrate both sides, then I'll get that one half velocity squared is g times the big radius squared over y plus some constant. Now, suppose that we're lifting off from this mass, so maybe we're on the Earth and we're, we want to lift off with a, a, support, a certain initial velocity, which we'll call v naught. And so we get a boundary condition uh, that v of capital R equals v naught. And that allows us to solve for C being one third V naught squared minus G times R. And now we have a, a 
differential equation, an implicit solution, uh, where we're looking at v as a function of y. Now, we can get interesting information here. So for example, we could get an estimate for the escape velocity. What is the escape velocity? That's the velocity you need to achieve in order to escape the force of gravity of that large object. And what does that mean? Well, that your velocity never becomes zero or never obviously never becomes negative. If negative, that means you're falling back onto the surface of the object. So you want your velocity v to remain positive for all values of y which are uh, positive. So in other in, especially as y goes to infinity. So when y gets really large, uh, v squared approaches v not squared minus 2gr. And then we want that v squared to be positive for all time. So in other words, the v not squared minus 2gr has to be positive. And so v naught should be larger than radical 2gr. Since this is an estimate, we could say that v naught could be larger than or equal to uh, 2gr. Uh, just to be able to uh, use it as an estimate. So the escape velocity should be more than radical 2gr. So let's estimate the escape velocity from the Earth in miles per hour. We're going to uh, use the estimate of the radius of the Earth to be 4,000 miles and we use the acceleration due to gravity as 32 feet per second squared. So we got to do some unit conversions with our G in order to get things in terms of miles per second squared, and then just substitute into our formula. That gives an answer of about 25,000 miles per hour. Well, what would the escape velocity be on the moon? What we're told here is that the acceleration due to gravity on the moon is about 0 0.165 g, where g is the acceleration due to gravity on Earth. So it's about one sixth. We have about one sixth of the acceleration. Uh, we're going to use an estimate of 1,080 miles for the radius of the moon, and we'll use that information to calculate the escape velocity. So rather going back directly to this formula, calculating a new g, which we could do. There's no problems with that. I'm going to look at this and say, well, what would be the ratio? If I calculate the ratio, uh, I can do some algebra where the g's are going to divide out, the twos are going to divide out. And I'll just be left with the square root of 0 0.165 times 1080, the ratio of the uh, radii of the moon and the Earth. So 1080 over 4000. And so that's a little bit more than one fifth. And so if I uh, multiply that ratio times the escape velocity for the Earth, I get an escape velocity of around 5,291 miles per hour.